All Good morning. Right. <laughs> we are back again. It is March 3rd, 2021. Uh, I am Steve Foster. I am the former committee director and general counsel for the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, uh, where I had the opportunity to meet one Kevin Lawrence, the executive director of the Texas Municipal Police Association. And we are seeking ways to find solutions uh, to better our society, policies, interaction between citizens and law enforcement. That's about the shortest way uh, I can say the intro makes sense to all of us. We have members from Houston, from DPS, Irving, uh, North Texas, and again, Kevin Lawrence uh, representing uh, TMPA as its executive director. Dallas, don't, don't forget Frederick. We got Dallas in here too. So. Well, I, I said that, I said North Texas. I, I did yes, Dallas, uh, McKinney, um, and Frisco area as as well. Um, and congratulations as a as a new um, cowboy goes in. And and I heard the story of Drew Pearson um, was told at the Star. He got set up by Jerry Jones and Roger Staubach. Uh, it way too long for him to, to get inducted. With that said, uh, way to... overdue. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, with that said, I want to go to something that uh, will be discussed, will uh, be a topic of concern, will be um, explained to the best of our abilities here in the next 48 minutes. And that's uh, the fact that we, in Texas and then the Texas legislature are looking at legislation uh, that definitely involves police reform. There are many pieces of legislation that have perspectives in regards to police reform, uh, different types of bias uh, and the like. However, there's one in particular piece of legislation that has been labeled, coined, uh, named the George Floyd Act. Yes. With that said, most people may not think much beyond the name and the fact that that was an instance that occurred in Minnesota and Minneapolis uh, that affected uh, adversely a citizen of the state of Texas, in particular in the Houston area. Uh, George Floyd played on the Houston Yates football team uh, back in the day and um, did extremely well for them. Unfortunately, through uh, life occurrences, uh, he found himself uh, in the Midwest northern part, and we know that uh, on the fateful day, he encountered law enforcement, and that case not yet adjudicated. However, uh, the footage of a knee on his neck, not good, to say the least. Nonetheless, back in Texas, as we move forward from that incident, uh, the legislation looking to possibly address some of the things uh, has been titled the George Floyd Act. You have not had the discussions I have had along with Nikki and uh, Rudy, uh, other members and the chair of the African-American lawyer section of the State Bar of Texas in regards to, you hear this so many times, what's in a name? Well, right now, a piece of legislation and the name could cause consternation or give us uh, some hesitancy by groups that are on this Facebook Live that want to support police reform, that want to enhance the way law enforcement interacts with uh, all persons in the communities, whether uh, they're predominantly minority, predominantly black, predominantly white, regardless. So I'm going to turn this over to Kevin Lawrence, who didn't necessarily start the discussion, but made mention that terming legislation to George Floyd Act, he'd like to explain. And then I believe there's at least one or two more participants that would like to share in, uh, there is something to what's in a name in regards to legislation and how the support can be garnered to move the state of Texas forward in ensuring the safety of all of its citizens. Kevin. Well, uh, the argument I want to make is that if a piece of legislation is passed, if there is police reform passed in the 2021 Texas legislature, whether or not 
the authors of the bill, whether or not the media, whether or not different advocacy groups are going to call it the George Floyd Act is beyond our control. It's beyond the control of the legislature. Uh, if George Floyd is specifically mentioned in the caption of the bill or the titling of the bill, or the the bill you know, that's another thing. But the, the fact that George Floyd's name is being invoked and is going to be invoked during the process, we believe is ways, um, not the least of which is it evokes a great deal of emotion. And emotion is not what public policy should be based upon. Public policy should be based upon fact. It should be based upon history, documented history. We still don't know all the facts of the George Floyd case. It hasn't been litigated yet. It hasn't been uh, adjudicated yet. I, I think the trial is actually set, set to start next week on Officer Chauvin. But what we hear from a law enforcement perspective is almost invariably when that incident is mentioned, it is referred to as the police killing of George Floyd. It is referred to as George Floyd dying at the hands of law enforcement. And we're not sure that that's the way the, the, the facts are going to play out in a courtroom. The, the autopsy, and I, and I realize there are two different interpretations of the autopsy results that are out there. Both of them say that the primary cause of death was not the police involvement. They do indicate that the police involvement was contributory or might have been contributory, but was not the underlying cause. Okay. So like you said, the perception is not good. The imagery is not good, but the underlying facts become something different. And then you. So Kevin, when you, when you say just, just to, uh, cause intuitively, I would think if I'm watching and you said it's a questionable, let me, let me phrase it that way, that George Floyd did not die at the hands of law enforcement. It's, it, did I, did I s properly say that? The, so you the, would... their actions were the actual cause of his death. In other words, if law enforcement, if the officers had not been touching him, if, when they were trying to arrest him and he decided to go limp and they just let him go to the ground and left him laying there while they're waiting on the ambulance and they weren't touching him at all, might he still have died from the other factor, from the, the, the drug overdose, the, the, the you know, uh, other underlying heart disease that he had? Is it not possible that he would have died anyway. And I think that's going to be played out in a courtroom. Okay. But, but, but again, you know, the flip, you know, as, as my dad always says to me, uh, he quotes the great and former uh, Ross Perot, no matter how thin the pancake, there's two sides. There's always two sides. So Agreed. Agreed. we don't want to, we don't want to discount the fact that a knee on someone's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds could also be a cause of death. I personally think the knee in the small of his back had would have more to do the, with that than the one on the back of his neck. But that comes from years of experience in this as well. The one in the and this is why we're talking about it because I, I want you to get out perspective. Whether anybody agrees with it or, or not, I, I just I, want this to be discussed. No, but I but I will tell you from from experience, from training, from going through all these scenarios over and over again. The, the weight in the small of the back or the middle of the back inhibits breathing a lot more than the knee on the back of the neck, okay? There was nothing being done to the front of the neck and that's where the breathing occurs, okay? Breathing goes from the front of the neck into the diaphragm. So the knee on the back of the diaphragm may have had, but we don't know. We're still waiting for all that to get played out. That's our point is not couple that, I'm gonna finish my, what I was gonna say, couple that with the fact that most of the different policy recommendations that are in the George Floyd Act have nothing to do with George Floyd. <laughs> right. It's yet another indication that it is, it is being used for the emotion. So you're saying it's more ceremonial than anything else? Or tactical than anything else. But th that depends on your point of view. It's right. We might see it from this side of ceremonial, this side is tactical. Does it help us get to good public policy? That's our concern. Right. And you know that I've worked with you on good public policy in the criminal justice world. Now, did it come with a scenario such as the incidents that we've had as of late? No. 
there were other incidents. Tulia was going on at the time, and that's 20 years ago. Some may have to Google that one if they weren't available uh, for that. But we've talked about lightning rod and, and, and very sensitive issues uh, of, of a variety of nature in the criminal justice world. So I'm not going to talk about any other things that I worked on. I'm just talking specific about that. And I think it's important, Kevin, because as you mentioned, this thing's going to trial. And the optics and what people see and people are going to go, you know what, that's just another white law enforcement cop trying to tell me a knee on the neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Yeah. But, yeah. but again, let me, let's frame it completely because again, this is what will be deliberated. And I think this is where also citizens, when, if in fact your perspective prevails, then people get unhappy and upset because it seems the obvious is now being told, you, you saw what you saw, Nonetheless, that's not really what happened to this gentleman. There were prior or pre-existing uh, factors in his body that contributed more so than this officer's knee on this person's neck. That, There's to the average photograph. citizen, though, can, can be insightful. There's a very famous photograph of a play from one of the Super Bowls where there's a receiver coming down with the ball in the back of the end zone, hitting the ground, and they take the photograph at the exact moment. There's a referee on either side. One of them's got his hands up, and the other one is signaling incomplete. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Butch Johnson against the against the Denver Broncos, 1979. Beat the Orange Crush. Craig Morton was the starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos against Roger Staubach. That is the Super Bowl that Drew Pearson won. Again, how do you how do you know this? Steve Steve just won the sixty four thousand dollar question. <laughs> I'm a sports. I'm I, I'm a student athlete. I, I've been a student athlete, and and but, and I know something that I'm passionate about. And I think that is the same type of information you have to have in this arena to really get to the brass tacks. You need to absolutely know at any given time what you're talking about. Was there a chokehold involved in George Floyd? Fred, was there a chokehold involved in the George Floyd situation? You know, that's the, that's the question. You, you ask one person, you get one answer. You ask another person, you get another answer. And, Doug, and that's no. just, Doug says no. Fred says, well, it depends on who you ask. I will tell you, I, I had a debate with a, a representative of Black Lives Matter Houston chapter a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago now on a radio program. And I said, there was not a chokehold involved. And he said, oh, yes, there was. It was a blatantly illegal chokehold involved in the George Floyd case. Yeah. I saw what I saw and he saw what he saw. The question is who determines which perception is correct? And we have a system of jurisprudence that is supposed to make that decision for us. And we'll see what comes out of those courts. Well, and, and, that, and I think and, that's where, you know, I think and believe it's important to have a, a variety of backgrounds that may not be uh, politically motivated. Because again, to be able to interface, interface as black attorneys to law enforcement and to have these types of discussions, you have to understand if you don't put the information out so that it can be framed, it's hard to make good public policy because you don't wanna go from frame X or frame Y, which is not necessarily representative of the entire situation. And you even have to, uh, listen to Kevin as much as you can say what you saw is the obvious. The trier of fact is put in a tough position. And I think, and, and I just have to make this statement and I don't want it to be blanket, but I think that minority groups think that the triers of fact have been slanted against people that are, are of color because they see instances time and time again between grand juries and other things. And I guess we can pull all that out. But my point is it needs to be in a, in a forum the way that we have properly decided in a reasonable way to at least touch 
on it and, and get it to people who are listening and looking to make their own formulations and explain why it may be more difficult than easy to pass a bill called the George Floyd Act. And, and in order to, to try to, to address some of those concerns, and I'm going to turn this over to Doug because I know he's chomping at the bit. To say, <laughs> Sorry. When, when, when I first saw the video of what happened in Minneapolis. And I don't remember if it was the next day or several days later, but my wife was showing it to me. And I'm sure we've all discussed this at some point or another, but I don't know that we've discussed it live on, on this, this venue. My wife was showing it to me. She was very disturbed by what she was seeing. And I was telling her, that's a viable technique that is taught in police academies, in field training programs. That's a control technique that is that is used. And while I'm explaining that to her, it continues to go on and on. And I'm, you know, listening to the, the bystanders telling him, hey, he can't breathe. And, you know, and then I started getting irritated and I started saying, hey, man, get off of it. I'm not even watching it live. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, man, get off. And then I started getting mad. Now, now remember, this is my perspective, my personal perspective. I'm not speak, speaking on behalf of law enforcement. I don't have any details that you don't have. I'm just talking about what I saw in that moment. And as a veteran cop, I was thinking, okay, it's time now to, 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 to re-examine, to reassess where you're at. I think we have a duty of care. And I think that at some point, Chauvin should have leaned down and said, hey, pal, are you still with me? How are you doing down here? And I think that's where the failure occurred. Now, whether or not Chauvin was doing exactly what he had been trained to do, I don't know. I do know that Minneapolis had all of that, that exact scenario being taught in their police training at that moment to handle that situation just like that. Get them face down on the ground, control them, wait for medical personnel to arrive. I think that the rookies had some updated training that the veteran officers didn't have, and that was why the rookies said, hey, shouldn't we sit him up? But Again, all that's going to play out. I'm telling you, I think law enforcement understands there were systemic failures that took place in that scenario that need to be addressed. But claiming that a chokehold caused the death of George Floyd is going, in my opinion, is going down the wrong trail. It is looking to the, to the wrong systemic failures that took place there. So, Take it away. <laughs> and, and honestly, you have to look at it from a, a, a little different perspective. I'm looking at the George Floyd Act completely outside of the realm of what happened to George, okay? What happened to him is, is horrible, should never have happened. I don't think it would have ever happened that way here in Houston. Our guys would have stepped in, set the guy up, uh, ambulance coming. We train for that. We know what to do in that situation, okay? Okay, so let me, let me before you get going, and I don't want to detract from oh, what good. you're going to say. It seems to me that Texas would train differently than, as Kevin had mentioned, officer in Minneapolis, even though it's a technique that may be what was deemed viable, that may not be the modern or the most uh, recent technique, and it's probably something that wouldn't be uh, trained in Texas. Is that correct, Doug? Am I making right. an assessment? And I'll give you a scenario. We were taught what they call back in, in the 90s. Understand, it, it was 1990 when I went to the academy. <laughs> they had the, what they called the brachial stunt, which you went across this part of the neck right here with your hand, just like that, just like that, and it would, would take them down. It was, it was supposed to hit the nerves, drop them, okay? That stopped five years later. But did they train us differently after that? They trained the cadets differently. They didn't come back and tell us, hey, we're no longer using that. That's just how we were trained. And so we would use that. Even guys today still use that because it is an effective tool. Uh, it's pain compliance, that whole, the whole nine yards. But you don't hold the steady pressure on that part of that. We just wouldn't do that here, okay? But uh, uh, every group trains differently. They go through these different scenarios. We now have grappling. We never did that when I was in the academy. And before me, they did boxing. So it progresses over time, but it doesn't mean that everybody's trained the same over time. They don't bring us back. They don't bring us old guys back and go, hey, we're going to teach you how to grapple now. They, don't, they just don't do that. Which, so that's, problem, that's that, one that, scenario. Got, and, and, the, and I think the, the other thing that y'all are saying is what's in legislation in black and white is not addressing these issues that we're explaining right now on this Facebook Live. There are things that are outside what really actually 
took um, would be part of the fact pattern of the incident with George Floyd. Right. right. But but what I what I and this is what I was talking about earlier before we went live. The name George Floyd attached to the bill is going to be some consternation with some. And I'll tell you why, because here in Houston, uh, though he played at Yates and he's a hometown boy, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, he committed quite a few violent offenses here in Houston. So people remember that. Our mm. officers remember that. Mm -hmm. And as, as, as horrible and tragic as it was that he died, it doesn't change the fact that he had multiple felony arrests and convictions, which makes it hard for us to support something named after somebody that is considered, quote unquote, a criminal, no matter how he died. It, it, again, I'm not trying to make people mad or anything else. I'm trying to put No, it I'd rather hear the honest. I, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather have that honesty out here and it be said here in March, there's, there's time in, in a legislative session that at least you're, a, a, no one will say now your opinions and perspective were not heard prior to right. moving the committee and whatever else, the, the way that the bill and the legislation will unfold. Because I think it's important, again, the influences, as you know, when we're going through a session and how bills get passed, it's all about relationships and influence. And that's right. why I saw it and we saw it to try to put together this now before right. it was too late and to get the real understandings, whether you like them or not, at least out in the public forum in and, a way that and, wasn't political. It was right. just truthful. And here's what we need to let you know from our and group. The reason, I, the reason I even bring this up is because you're going to have some in the legislature, they're going to have a tough time putting their name on it right. just because of that fact. And we want to see good, positive change. We want to see good policy. We want to see good training. We want to see you know teeth within, within the bill. They're actually going to fix the things that need to be fixed. And you've already agreed to a lot of those things throughout right. our Wednesday morning meetings that you could go ahead and concede and say, let Ledge Council put these in legislation. Exactly. You're not going to have any consternation from Houston, TMPA, Irving, you know, Dallas, uh, North Texas area, and, and D DPSOA at least. You know, there's other organizations out there, but at least there's a solid group of folks that can support positive policy changes to improve law enforcement and interaction with the community and, yeah. and as much as people want to say it it's it's at the end of the day it's not about a name it's about getting fixed what needs to be fixed and i think we can all work together on that fact i just want to caution people that once you attach a name to it either positive or negative you're going to have issues getting it passed and i don't want to see that happen i want to see meaningful reform that will be beneficial to all our, not only police officers, but to the citizens whom we are bound to protect and serve. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Let's not forget when, when Doug talks about George Floyd was guilty of some violent crimes, he was tried and convicted and punished. He was sentenced to, you know, uh, prison, whatever. We should also contemplate the victims of those crimes and how they feel about this this name being attached to that bill. There's one specific case that was a particularly heinous offense, uh, burglary of a habitation with, with aggravated assault involved. And I, you know, I, I can only imagine how the victim of that crime feels about the, the, the hoopla around the name of George Floyd. So I'm just saying that, that I think that should also be considered. And, 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 and I will go with you and that's awful. Horrible. I, I, I've, I've taken an oath as an officer of the court to know that that's no way no my parents wouldn't have me do that before the state. But that person's still alive. And you're going to have people that said George is not. And again, he served his time. He did what he's supposed to do. Now you have to, again, balance the fact that here was a citizen who served his punishment to the extent and was living somewhere else. He had no issues at that time then the incident Other than occurred the fact that but, he was a crime at the moment that led to the law enforcement involvement at all well, uh, and again i mean 
And so the fentanyl. Just, just to balance it out, yeah. was it a crime that judge, jury, executioner at that point in time um, comes into play? This is why we're looking to have good agreed, public policy. You, and, and we're not disagreeing there. The argument is some people claim that he was, in fact, executed by law enforcement and ignore the fact that the autopsy shows cause of death was the drugs in his system and not the police intervention. Those were contributory, perhaps. We don't know that for a fact yet. But yes, those are conversations that we believe should be had, but right. they should, we should have them with as little emotion involved as possible while we're That's talking. That's tough. <laughs> That's tough. Frederick, Fred, yeah. do you want to say it's, something? Yeah, I saw you. I apologize, Fred. I've, I've had this argument with uh, a lot of constituents in McKinney that, you know, everything kind of revolves around when you, you get into a black and white subject. And when I say black and white, a black and white race subject. And so you have a very touchy subject and you have a person, to be honest with you, it wasn't a great guy. And and the reason why I say that is because his track record, his track record proved that. And you don't, no one wants to talk about that. And, uh, the lady that, you know, that he put the gun up to. And, and so, so we have a victim and we have, he, and he's also a victim, right? So you have, so have two victims here. He's, he's been a victim of drug abuse for a very long time, an addict. And, and even up to his death, he was still an addict because he put himself in a position to get talked to by the police, to get in a confrontation to the, for the police and maybe the wrong police officer on the wrong day making a bad decision, and but you've got a decision that happened. And you still have the fact of a person that put themselves there and, and, and now you can't take it back. Um, and then when when uh, Kevin asked earlier, was it a chokehold? No. If you go through, if you put a hundred experts up that teach defensive, defensive tactics across the state, 100 are gonna say that was not a chokehold. Uh, where they say that was a trained position for him to be in? No, uh, we've we've all we already covered that. That could, that you can beat that dead horse to death a, a million times. The the but Kevin made a very valid point earlier. If they would have just said, and I've said this, I've said this on the president's commission. I've said it on the panels. If the officers would have sat him up and just left him up against the car and just stood on both sides of him, and if George Floyd would have died right there like that that we wouldn't be having this conversation because there are thousands of George Floyds that have died like that. I've had one happen like that. Uh, many officers have had off of, have individuals die in their custody. And it, the most of the time they die in the custody is because of their own doing. It well, has I say, and I'll say, say, say this one, Fred, I would say there's one race, a bunch of ethnicities, that's just me. That's how I look at it, because I think we all come <laughs> as humans from one spot. But that's, yes. again, personal. Um, I think where you get people where we are now is that I agree with you that and we talked about even scenarios that are um, labeled death in custody, and it may not have to do with what you would think exactly custody test well. but when you have someone using that particular technique mm -hmm. and then you get the result i think it's hard to separate that if you have your knee on my neck then i die that there's other or a lot of other contributory factors because of what you see it and you say that's inhumane as to what kevin and, and doug said initially we probably after a certain point in time would have said, Hey, he's under control. Let's yes. set him up. And, 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 and there's where now you're having the emotion, which is not a great way to make public policy. I don't care if you're a hundred percent, right. I know I was disciplined as a youth and I got a lot of, <laughs> Kind of, you know, be, it, it, when people were unhappy and mad, that were a lot different in how they treated me when they backed up, took a look at the situation and then said, you're not going to be able to hang out with Doug and Fred and go to the movies then the weekend, as opposed to that belt and all kinds of other chaos that broke out because instantaneously that emotion took over the parental units. Hey, I get I'm it. My mom dragged me out of a pickup truck 
when I was 16 years old because the girl was too old and he, she didn't want to be raising a kid. Uh, and she said, this is how it's going to work. And I, right. and I was so damn mad at her, but that, that's We're a probably related because that's the exact same tactic. My mom used for <laughs> other issues. <laughs> I, I think, and, and again, I think this is going to be very unpopular, but I think we should also mention the fact that those officers were focusing on the bystanders. Uh, which has become an issue for law enforcement more and more uh, over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And again, Doug and Fred can talk to this better than I can. And Travis would too, if we could fix his technical difficulties. But more and more folks are infusing themselves into law enforcement situations because they feel like they've got a right to. They feel like they've, they, that and even though they might have a right to, it's still maybe not a good idea, but law enforcement more and more is having to worry about the perimeter and not about the substance of what it is we're, we're working on at that given moment. And, and, and I think that's also a contributory factor here. I think the officers focus, focusing on the bystanders took some of their attention away from George Floyd. Doug, Fred? So let me say this. Looking at a natural bell curve, there's going to be a small group of people that say, I don't care what kind of information you give me, the knee on the neck killed George. Boom. There's going to be a group that say technique, contributory factors. He was done before the unfortunate unsightliness occurred. We're probably going to have to play for that middle piece because that's where we can say, okay, let's look at everything. Let's find public policy. Let's not throw a motion in there. Yes, I'm not happy that I saw what I saw, just like you said initially. That will play, but the, the, what rules the day is solid public policy that gets us forward in a society. We go off half cocked uh, based on you know, social media and different things like that. And I'll just couch it that way. You may not get the result you want. Agreed. Agree. And, and by the way, and, and I've been in this business at the legislature, Steve, like you say, a long time, we've known each other a long time. The, 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 the moniker, the, the, you know, whatever we call the bill probably doesn't affect me nearly as much as it does. The officers, officers, officers. Reach today, to be honest with you. Uh, I remember, you know, there was a bill that we helped push through years ago that we named the Aubrey Hawkins bill. Right. Aubrey was a Carrollton police officer who had sent us the information recommending it's, it's the, it's the move over law. The one that says if there's a, a police vehicle on the side of the road, emergency vehicle with lights activated, you have to slow down or move over. Aubrey had sent the, us that as, as saying, why don't we have this law? Other States do. And so we started pushing that bill through. And then Aubrey was killed even before right. the session started, right around Christmas time that year, was killed by the Texas Seven. So we we called it the Aubrey Hawkins bill in his memory, even though it had nothing to do with the way he died. So I understand the emotion that attached to that, and it helped get the bill some attention that it might not have gotten otherwise. It was a good piece of legislation, though, and it passed. So I, we understand that you know that that is part of the political process. Yep. We're just saying that the name itself is going to have effects on both sides. And neither one of those emotional reactions to these issues is going to help get the good public policy that we're looking for. Right. And that and that's the very most important situation, because at the end of the day, as we know, or as you may know, the sponsors from Symphonia Thompson uh, in the House and Royce West in the Senate who are, are moving these bills, both attorneys, and they're looking at this, what we're trying to say and what we tried to get a head start on uh, last year, uh, mid-year, was recognizing, because Kevin and myself and others here know how this process works, know what public opinion and now social media, which has been now included in, in, in the legislative process, for good or bad purposes, uh, good or bad intentions, good or bad outcomes, all play into getting uh, the proper number of votes, but not just votes. You want what's passed to be uh, at least substantially effective in creating a better environment for law enforcement and its community that it serves. And I think, Doug, you always go back to that um, not that the others don't or not that we don't, um, 
but that seems to be because again, if, for those that don't know, Doug's um, primary um, beat and interest, Sunnyside and in, in, in Houston is predominantly black Americans. And you found yourself being highly effective in that area, regardless of what you look like because of time taken, interaction, listening, and understanding the area you served for the Houston Police Department. I'm very proud of, of the organization as a whole and what we've done. Uh, you know, you look around and, and see for, for all his faults, Acevedo did a very good job uh, during the, the, the times that we had here with protests and everything else, uh, you know, for good or bad, we did very well in Houston and we didn't have, you know, the burning and looting and all that, all that kind of uh, stuff that happened in other cities. And I think a lot of that has to do with our communication with the community. Uh, as an organization, the HPOU does everything we can to be out in the public eye. We try to be honest and open with everybody. I do interviews with anybody that'll talk to us. And yes, I have voted to fire people on our department before as a member of the discipline committee. Uh, do I enjoy it? No, but I also understand that uh, we have a job and a duty to protect the community. And if someone breaks that trust, then I don't want it, them here tarnishing the badge that I worked so hard for. I've been well, here 30 years. The, Go ahead. And, and, and what, what you're saying is, and I think what we're trying to convey here publicly is we know that there's still time for members and their staffs to communicate in the same fashion that you're talking about, Doug and Kevin, and to recognize we can put some very good public policy pieces into legislation. Again, you've made aware that what's in the name does make a difference, but Kevin, you recognize you want the policy at the end of the day to be that which is helpful to law enforcement and beneficial to its officers, deputies, troopers, constables, and the public at large. More that important, public, more importantly, to the citizens we serve. By the way, I well, that yeah, public at large, citizens you serve, though, correct, even absolutely. Though Travis, even though Travis can't can't talk with us right now because of technical difficulties, he's pointed out to me that Aubrey Hawkins was an Irving police officer, not a Carrollton police officer. So I apologize <laughs> for that mistake. Uh, but yeah, and, and, and I wanted to say this, I, I don't believe that, that having the name Aubrey Hawkins, I'm sorry, having the name George Floyd on this bill in any way changes the commitment that, that Senator West or Representative Thompson have to the, to the underlying issues. Taking the name off would not change our opposition to those public policy recommendations that are in there. We're simply talking about the emotional uh, impact that it has on the conversation, on the discussion. And, and I think that's important to note. Like I say, I think at the end of the day, whatever, if, if a bill is passed, if we get any police reforms, uh, uh, public policy issues passed, regardless of whose bills they are, I think some quarters are going to refer to it as the George Floyd Act, and there's nothing we can do th th that's going to stop that. I, we just need to make sure we're focusing the conversation on the facts, on the policy issues, and not on the emotions. Right, and I so think what we've got to do in that. Right, and what we've said is, I believe that there's at least a handful of things that we can identify that can be passed successfully and agreed upon. That's good public policy. That's already been identified over, gosh, the 30 weeks that we've had the opportunity and willingness and consistency to meet. And not all of it, not all of it requires legislation either. I don't know correct. if you correct. yesterday about uh, the the uh, uh, racial profiling data the you know that's been collected now for twenty years, and whether or not T. Cole has been properly requiring all the agencies to submit the full extent of what they're supposed to be submitting. The article, I got to tell you, I don't I. I don't believe it, it did a, a really fair job of explaining the situation. It seemed to be very one-sided, but I do understand that there is some data that is not currently available on the TCOL website that should be available. And those are conversations that need to be had. I don't know that we need legislation to fix that, 
Well, we've you? already discussed some of those <laughs> those things. And again, because Sunset, uh, the Sunset Advisory Commission, which has uh, been uh, commandeered by the state to review state agencies uh, periodically, whatever that has been designated for each agency, they go through and they look from top to bottom, head to toe, about all of functions, uh, policies, um, personnel, all the issues uh, regarding that agency, and they've made recommendations, which I think is is a benefit during this session that addresses TCOL. And we know through either policy, policy legislation, combination of sorts, improvements can be made. As you mentioned, some may not have to be legislative in nature, but just updating, maybe uh, providing more uh, funding for more uh, employees to take on some of these functionalities that allow some of the administrative things to, to occur. Uh, some may just be uh, technology based and, and of affording links to information and data that's been collected that may not be readily available. So having said all that, <laughs> Did we finish up the talks about the individual policy issues last week? Did we, did we get through the entire list? Well, what I was going to suggest, and, and because uh, you, you have done very well and we've done well to congregate even after we've talked by email uh, 10 to 15 minutes prior to going live, I, I think because of some of the things that occur, we've, we've made a shift. I think I'd like to say to the audience, we can pick up and, and at least finish up the policy next week and we'll have Nikki and, and Rudy joining us. But I think it was um, the 800 pound gorilla in the room was the name on the legislation. And there, and there needed to be some explanation to why the perspective is um, with recognizing that. Because I think that could have been a foregone conclusion and we were just gonna work uh, within the four corners of, of, of paper to work on legislation and maybe omit or look past what the legislation was called. And that in itself brought about a discussion that lasted, you know, at least an hour if you take the time prior to us going live here on Facebook. And, and I think it's important that that be expressed so that no one is is all of a sudden blindsided because of the name of the legislation and it is articulated and discussed i think without somebody giving pushback and, and allowing that forum and and the platform to to allow you kevin and, and doug some of the perspective so that at least it is out there and that people can recognize if they hear Law enforcement is against the George Floyd Act. I don't want to make that a, a, a broad brush of we don't like what's in it, but there are name and policy questions from law enforcement that may be improved if, in fact, two sides collaborate and talk and discuss. And again, as you said, Kevin, it still may be referred to and called and maybe even named. But at least if you can get past the first page of the caption and you see public policy that actually is effective and something that you've assisted the members and staff in creating and working with T. Cole on some things that can be done administratively through Texas Register um, meetings and things of that with rule promulgation and updates, we could have something uh, very good uh, come out of 2021. And I think that actually brings me back to something I think we kind of just skipped right over earlier, talking about the, how, how training is done at different agencies, even just within the state of Texas. Because you talked about, well, maybe Texas trains differently than Minneapolis does. Well, I got news for you. Dallas trains differently than Houston does. And DPS, by the way, Clay, we brought up boxing a while ago. Is, is DPS still teaching boxing? Do you still have boxing in your basic academy for DPS? Uh, I think it's called what Doug said earlier, grappling. Uh, when I went through four decades ago, it was pure boxing. Uh, quite frankly, what I see them do now, uh, I'm glad we didn't do. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they have a two-on-one scenario, you know, things of that nature, and the, the fight ends when either the cadet 
wins or until whether he, whether he loses. And we, oh. unfortunately, we actually had a train a cadet die ten years, ten or more years ago. He took a blow to the top of the head on his way down to the mat, and uh, just a freak accident. And so they reevaluated what they were doing uh, and policy came up with this grappling changes. scenario. Yeah, policy changes almost always come from incidents like yeah, that. Yeah. So you were taught boxing in the academy. That, that was what 30, 35, 50 years ago. How long? How long? Uh, uh, Thirty-nine, I think. Thirty-nine years well, ago. And, and and Kevin, Kevin, you you make a you you make a great point that policy me. changes come from incidents. But so let's to, not. So so I, I'm going to make a point though. I promise you, Clay. In thirty-nine years, how many times did you actually put on boxing gloves? in the line of duty and duke it out with some guy out there on the highway how many times uh i think uh, i had a partner one time where we actually came pretty close to uh stopping the car and getting in the bar ditch but uh, never just the two of you the two cops were yeah in yeah the two cops yeah but in yeah, the line you know when you're in a car for eight hours with somebody it gets pretty personal here's my point steve 39 years of not using it didn't teach dps maybe we need to change our training one death of one cadet caused them to reevaluate. Re right. Okay. Sure. We understand that law enforcement is constantly reevaluating, reassessing based upon experience. The reasons that Dallas and Houston and DPS train differently is because they have different experiences. They've gotten sued over different things. They've had court cases come down over different things and they have adopted, they've adapted based upon those, those common experiences. We do. I think we are all in agreement. It would be a good idea if the state of Texas came up with best practices, policies that all agencies can try to, you know, agree upon, that all agencies can try to adapt. But you can never take this one thing away. If Clay or Fred or, or, or Travis or Doug is out tomorrow and they get into a situation where they're in a fight for their lives, they're going to use whatever techniques they have to use. Understood. Absolutely. Understood. I'm the same way. Don't, 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 don't discount me. <laughs> and, and I didn't get, go through police training, but I had some pretty savvy friends along the way, starting in middle school that said, Steve, if you get in trouble and, and I get it. And, and I was fortunate to do some, some other formalized things that I, I don't talk about, but um, yes, you have to, because you have to protect your person. Agreed. Yeah. Well, you got to, and you got to protect the people around you too. Let's, yes. let's not forget this. Every, you know, I, I, people talk about how cops are involved in the deaths of unarmed individuals, you know, and, and which is a very small percentage of cases, but it, but it does exist. Cops have to be cognizant of the fact that every time we get into a physical altercation, there's at least one gun involved every single time. Cause the, you know, the cops armed, right? And I, how many times, guys, have people tried to take your gun away from you? How many times have you gotten into that struggle with that drunk or that that you know wife beater or whoever, and they start grabbing for your pistol? It's always a consideration. It's always a factor. We have to make sure we don't lose because if we lose, it's not just us. It's those victims we were trying to protect that are also now in harm's way. And take a look. We, we, we just sent out that video, what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago? where the, the constable is just walking through the mall doing security. Some guy runs up and tries to take his gun. Uh, it happens. It did, they does happen. was, did they figure that was a gang initiation? Is that what they figured they, out? I, we still don't know why he did it. I don't know if he's just crazy or what, but yeah, it, it did happen though. It's, I mean, it's on video. And if it hadn't been for that Houston officer that happened to be close by, he probably would have succeeded. Yep. Yep. It was a fight. No doubt. Okay. Okay, so next week we'll get back to the policy issues. We'll send some emails around about exactly which ones we haven't covered yet. Hey, yes. can I jump in there for a second? I Absolutely, to, Fred. I wanted to follow up with uh, with Kevin and, and Doug, and, and even Clay on, on this. So the the and then the, <laughs> giving you a lot of credit today, uh, Kevin. <laughs> he hit he hit on another issue. I know that hurts you, Fred. I know. It's I know. It's just totally <laughs> cool. um, so in our training, as our training goes along, and it's an involvement, and, and no different with DPS, uh, 
on their traffic stops, uh, why they approach from the passenger side, from the driver's side, or check, you know, the, the, the check the truck, all the things that little things in Houston, their, the way they do their, their job. But there's been a hundred and nine, I think it's right, Doug, 119 officers been killed in your department. Yes, sir. So we have 87 in Dallas and I think the troopers are at 90. I don't know if that's. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so you you make a combination right there, and I'm not sure with Irving. I know I know one for sure, but I, I don't know how how many have been killed there. So wh why I'm saying that when you add all those up, every single one of them died differently. Every single one of them become a training issue, and so at those academies where they're taught, they're taught because they're the investigation agency over most of the most of those cases. So they show, you know, down the line, well, how, how did this, how did this work? Norm Smith, I'll give you an example of, of a, almost a no-knock warrant ish, uh, where the guy shot through the, the, the door, hitting Norm in the eye, killing him. Uh, you, you, all of them have some training factor into them. And so that's why when you say, well, why are they trained this way? Well, because they had an incident where they got killed or uh, severely wounded, or, or, uh, uh, but that's how training is, is really educated at all these academies. Uh, and and, they're, and, they're, and no, it's no different with FBI or ATF. And I'm over at the US Marshal Service. We train, uh, I'll give you a scenario that happened in Florida where the guy uh, killed a person, hung him uh, over, the, over the attic like he was wounded and then waited for them to enter to, to, to extract the person from the attic that was hanging right there. You know, hang, like dangling his feet and his arm. And, and so when they came in, he killed all the marshals coming in. So there's scenarios on each situation that, that become a technique or a training issue. And that's where Kevin was going with that. But in real life time, that's why we change our training. So, so two things. Uh, Travis mentioned there are three Irving uh, police officers uh, that, that were killed. The other thing is, could you develop, before we go, could, could you develop something, <laughs> easy Kevin, that, that law, <laughs> law schools develop where the first year is pretty similar across the board. So training maybe on day one between DPS, uh, Irving, McKinney and Dallas and Houston are the same. And then day two and three can be specific to your environments, but at least then people know you've been given the same basic fundamentals and then whatever the training becomes due to your area or experience or environments then can deviate. But at least we know the base first day of training or whatever, first two days are, are, are sa the same across Texas. Is that, is that something that, that could be uh, uh, adopted and, and then and, and yeah. gone from there. So at least the, the, the citizens or T. Cole and the legislature knows that there's a basic, you know, we do contracts, torts, you know, property, uh, criminal. It, it, it's all the same regardless of what law school you go to. But from there, they, they teach it and, and you have a variety of, of elements and classes you can take after that. Just really? a thought. And we can save yeah. that for next week. There's only um, one however you want to do it, Kevin. That's only one thing where we can do it. All we need is money. Yep. Somebody's got and, and, there, and there probably are blocks of time that are overlap, but I'm, you know, HPD, DPD, their DPS, they're all going to get the traffic criminal law. Uh, there are. You know, they're going to get the basic. The basic academies all have the same curriculum. I got you. Okay. They're being taught exactly the same, but they've all, okay. but it's 700 hours, a grand total of 700 hours in the basic academy. You know, now other, some departments do more than that, but right. what is, by law is seven it's less than half of the time required to become a licensed cosmetologist in this state so uh, again the question is are we willing to fund it right excellent so, That's a good how about we talk about it next hey, week you, you don't need to be a cosmetologist in my academy your hair is going to look like this <laughs> after day one <laughs> well i'll tell you what listen um again i certainly appreciate your 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 transparency and straightforwardness and candidness about uh, a situation that everyone in the country knows the name George Floyd. What um, your perspective is, is gonna vary between who you are, what you do during the day and how your life experiences have played out to this point. But again, I certainly wanted to get in the open 
the concerns that law enforcement has from that perspective. Because I don't want anyone to say, oh, well, they never said anything about this. Well, I, I don't want it to hopefully only come from uh, sometime in March on a Facebook Live. I hope that uh, Kevin, you, Doug, Fred, everyone can interface at some point with a legislator or two, especially Ms. T, uh, Sinfronia Thompson and, and Senator West and the group and the criminal justice committees on the House and Senate side to express policy concerns and let them know exactly the straightforwardness that you've given us today. And, and I'm putting it out there right now because I know they have people that watch this they may not always get to watch it themselves, but they have people watching. I am willing to talk to any of them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I know I, 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 that goes for Kevin and Frederick as well. We're here. We're open. We will talk to anybody, anytime, because all three of us are very, or all of us actually on this, on this are very passionate about what we do, about our officers, and, and about the state of Texas. And you're not adamant to listen and you're not adamant to work something out. And I, I want that to, because again, uh, the African-American lawyer section of the state bar of Texas also has um, some legislation we're looking at that you and, and us, we have collaborated, talked about. We, we want it to, to get across the line so we can make improvements for the state of Texas. So we appreciate everybody uh, taking time out today. And we certainly will come back next week talking more policy, hopefully Nikki. And I know she's got some, some uh, training uh, with bias and things of that nature today. But it's great to see everyone and great to know we're moving forward. I uh, pray everybody is, is back up and running from water and electric and heat. And um, no worries, we'll get Travis fig figured out uh, with his sound, but he can still text us. And we certainly want these uh, times not to just be uh, great pieces that people can go back and view, but hopefully they effectuate change and can be incorporated some way, somehow positively in this legislative session with legislation that can be good policy for citizens uh, that law enforcement are designed to protect and the law enforcement as well. Harmonious and, and, and uh, forward thinking and moving uh, in, for both groups. So thank you again, and we'll be back next Wednesday, 10 a.m. We appreciate it. See you then. Thank Take you. Care, guys. See you. All thank right. You.